Hello everyone and welcome to this week's speaker series. My name is Catalin Laguerre, but I go by Cat. I'm going into my second year here at the State College of Florida. I'm currently a member of the Student Government Association here at State College of Florida and have been since last year. I am the Interclub Council President. As the ICC President, it is my job to encourage representation from the various clubs, organizations, and academic areas on campus. I plan to transfer to Florida State University in fall 21 to study political science or social work. My goal in life is to help as many people as possible by being a human rights activist and fighting for those who think they do not have a voice. Today, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Pinckney. Um, Dr. Brenda Pinckney graduated from Bethune-Cookman University where she received her bachelor's degree in psychology. She then received her master's degree from the University of South Florida in counselor education and earned her doctorate degree from Agassiz University in Educational Leadership with a concentration in higher education. She has been employed by the call since 1984, holding the position of professional assistant with a focus on career development, counselor one, advising three, director of advising services, director of student transition and support services, and director of diversity and inclusion. So hi, Kat, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I'm really excited about this opportunity um, here at State College of Florida with my recent um, appointment to the Director of Diversity and Inclusion. Um, I believe the work is actually um, something that it needs to be and should, should be sustainable throughout the existence of the college because what we're talking about here is gonna be really important um, as we move forward to make sure that all of our students be whatever background they have, that diversity is represented, but they also feel like they're included and they belong at the State College of Florida. So um, I, you know, I respect that, you know, Dr. Prosfeld is really wanting to take this journey and I'm just excited to just be a part of it. Perfect. So today we're going to be kind of talking about equality and diversity. We had a bunch of students send us a whole bunch of questions. So we're just going to be kind of going through those questions, kind of hearing what you have to say about them. And then I can also provide feedback as a student if you have any questions for me regarding what you think students are thinking. Um, the first question on the docket is what should black people do with the current climate of social and unrest? That, um, that question is, um, it has so many different parts to it, Kat. I think the biggest thing is uh, we need to educate ourselves as black people. Um, we need to really understand historically how we um, have been dealt with as a people, how we de dealt with situations. Um, um, the other important part is right now, because of all of these civil unrest, we need to be safe. Yes, ma'am. Um, and we have being, when I say safe, that means that you need to make sure that you're not in positions where you're endangered in any way um, by any group um, because we know that you know when people are uneasy about a situation sometimes the only way they know to respond is with violence so we really have to be careful and we have to be safe and then the other part of that is be confident in your truth know your truth be confident in it and then fact check you always want the facts you want to be able to speak with confidence because you have the facts and then know your rights Perfect. I love that. I really like how you said to be to be confident in what I have to say and to know my truth, because I feel like when I, sometimes when we speak about certain things and when I when I want to express how I feel about things, it can kind of be hard. And I like that advice that you gave to just know to be confident in what you're saying and to be able to speak your truth. So I appreciate that. I'll take that as a word of encouragement for myself personally. You're and welcome. That we got. Is there is there a day in America where black people have the same opportunity as white people? I remain hopeful. And when I say that, I remain hopeful with your generation. Um, we, we've seen where our ancestors have come through and they've fought many battles and they've been, um, they've shown their confidence and they've shown their diligence. But with your generation, because you guys are in a position where you are working together to question the system. Mm -hmm. you're, you're in a position where you question the protocols, you question the practices and you want answers. You're not going to take the answers that we'll get back to you. No, no, we, we want answers. And you do that in a way that is respectful, but you're demanding to have the answers so that you guys can move forward. So I remain hopeful with this generation. Um, I can see some small changes right now, but I'm, I, I'm hoping to see really big changes coming here shortly. 
Perfect. I like that. Um, it's kind of what you're saying. You kind of this kind of segues into it. The next question is, when is it necessary to take on or challenge the status quo? Anytime. Perfect. Whenever you see a wrong, when, when, when you see a wrong, when you're seeing people being mistreated, when you see a system that is being abusive, you should take on the challenge. Um, we've stayed at a, at a state of status quo for far too long. Exactly. Um, and I, I, that happens everywhere. It happens at our institution. It happens within our community. Sometimes it happens within in our own families. But whenever you see something that needs to be dealt with, talked about, addressed, it, there, the time is perfect at any time. How you approach it, of course, is with professionalism. And um, you go into a situation where you're wanting answers, but you're also leaving the opportunity so that you can see and accept the differences in opinions. You're respectful of the person that you're asking the questions of, but definitely anytime that you see something needs to be challenged, go for it. I like that. Okay. What creates prejudice and what can an individual, and I think they meant to say what creates prejudice and how can an individual overcome it? Ignorance, I, I believe, not yeah. understanding. Yeah. Um, when when you find who is prejudiced, many times what you'll find is that they don't know. They don't understand a person. They don't understand a person's background. They don't understand a, a person's um, economic status or struggles. So when you are ignorant to something, you become prejudiced. So what you have to do is you have to really check your ignorance and check your level of understanding because you only get to a point where prejudices can be addressed when people understand who they are, they understand their unconscious biases, and then they begin when they begin to question that within themselves because know thyself. Mm -hmm. When you know yourself, then you can understand better why you have some of your beliefs. Some of it is just by the way people were raised. Yeah. And we know that. And a lot of that comes from just family heritage. But prejudice, I think, is definitely created through ignorance and not knowing and not understanding. How do you overcome it? You know who you are. You begin to soul search for yourself. Why do I think this way about a particular group? Why do I believe this? Or why is my belief this way for this particular topic or subject? You look at, I think the biggest thing is you go inward. Mm -hmm. Look at yourself, ask yourself, why do you feel this way? Why do you identify this way? Why do you look at a particular situation in a certain way? So definitely um, check yourself. No, I think I think you worded that really beautifully. Um, I just I like the way you worded that. I think just kind of knowing who you are is just going to kind of help you feel more confident in yourself so that you way you can be more open to understanding other people. So I really like the way you answered that. And I feel like that was the perfect way to answer that question. Thank you. Um, because it, it's, it's going to be really important um, because if you want to address something and you want to make changes, all changes typically start with who you are. Exactly. And like just learning. I feel like sometimes we don't want to learn. We just kind of we get kind of comfortable knowing what we already know. And we're not really open to just kind of knowing about ourselves, learning about other people, what other people have to go through. So I really like ignorance. Exactly. Ignorance is like that's not good. You need to learn about other people and learn different things. Absolutely. And another part of that um, is that when you find people who have a trust in another individual or a trust in a system that has been damaged in some way in the way that they believe they have influence and those influences carry over and i think that affects the way some people move forward in their lives because it may not be what they want to believe but it's what that influencer has in upon them in their lives so they take on the beliefs of the influencer Oh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> that's good. I like that point. Okay. And how can non minorities contribute to social justice, equality, and diversity? Knowledge. Again, educate yourself. If you want to see change in the social injustice that we see and that is practiced and that is brought forward, if you want to see change in systematic um, discrimination or racism, gain knowledge for yourself understand. Talk to people who have, have um, experienced those things. How do they feel about it? How do they see it? You want to definitely inform yourself um, in order to be able to make a change, to become that ally that you want to be for that particular um, group. Oh, that's good. Okay. And another question that we got, 
is do you think as we portray people of color on screens in media and advertisement, it would bring an acceptance toward people from different backgrounds? Let me see if I can reword how they worded that. I think they're missing a little bit of words. Okay. It's um, okay. I think it's asking, do you think how we portray people on of color on screen and media and advertisement makes people kind of already have like a preconceived notion about who they are? I think that's what the person's trying to ask. We, we definitely have to look at that because when you look at media, when you look at news, when you look at um, even um, written um, documents and literature, the portrayal of black people tend to be very negative. Um, they're portrayed as angry, they're portrayed as beast, they're portrayed as people who don't take care of themselves, they're unclean. So definitely media plays a huge part, literature plays a huge part. So how do we um, help people to look beyond that? Again, it's going to be a, all a part of gaining knowledge and understanding because when you get to know people and then they're shocked it was like oh my god but this is what i see on media and there's a lot of times where you see and i talk to friends who are from different countries and different cultures and they tell you the things that they see on tv in their countries are only the bad images of black people so when they come to america and they have friends who are of color it's like but that's not what we saw. So for sure, media plays a huge part in the perception of any people, not just black people. Yeah, I was gonna say, I agree with that as well. I just feel like there's not as enough representation of all people of color and minorities in general. I don't feel like it's an equal platform. Like um, well, you can watch a movie and notice that there's not one person of color. And like a lot of people that aren't people of color probably wouldn't notice that. Or like it just, it doesn't have like an equal spectrum for every person and any minority in general, just people of different ethnic groups, people of different cultures. And if they do finally show somebody who is of a different heritage, culture, ethnicity, they show them in a way that's like the typical way of showing them that's not necessarily true to who they really are and show them like a real representation of who they are and what the culture has to bring. So mm -hmm. yeah, I, I think that's something that needs to be done, especially with like I'm personally Haitian, and I feel like sometimes on the media, all they talk about Haiti is how poor we are, and they don't really show and talk about how beautiful and how much culture we have. Um, I can't really speak to the culture because I, I don't know any other, but just personally, from where I'm from, I just feel like exactly what you said is true. I feel like the media needs to show that, like, different like there's good and bad people in every single culture every single Absolutely. color every single type of person and i wish that and i pray that hopefully in the future that the media and just advertisements and groups will just show that it's different for everybody there's a wide range of people and they're all different no matter their color so i have a question for you yeah, of course um, with that being said how do you see um because you want to go into social justice you want to go into social work how do you see your um, your ability to help change that mindset. How do you see yourself doing that? Honestly, I just, I've learned recently to learn to soften my heart um, because I, I am, I'm a very passionate person. <laughs> I, you can kind of tell what, by the way I speak, when I stand by something, I'm very passionate about it. And sometimes I can be kind of quick to like, uh, you don't agree with what I got to say. I don't want to hear what you got to say, but that's not good. Cause I still, have, in order for me to help my brother and sister, I have to be able to hear what my brother and sister has to say for that's me to be able to help them and aid them in any way possible. And to kind of get them to understand why I, where I'm coming from and why I believe what I believe. So I just hope that my heart continues to be softened and I can be, People who don't necessarily agree with what I got to say or what I what I what I believe for, I hope that my heart can continue to be softened to just be able to speak with them and for them to start understanding where I come from, um, just to be able to respect where I have to come from and just understand, kind of get an idea. OK, this is why Kat believes what she believes and this is why she has these political views and that's why she has these certain things. But my overall always goal was to help people like I love. I genuinely love helping people, especially for people who feel like they don't have a voice because we all have a voice. We're all here for a purpose and we were all we're all here for a reason. So mm -hmm. that's my overall goal in life is just as many people that that need and fuck, like they don't have a home. And they don't feel loved. I just want to I just want to love them and I just want to let them know that they're important. So that's kind of that's kind of I hope that answered the question. It, it, it does. It does. And the, and the thing is, is when we respect each other in our different places and our beliefs, that's when we begin to teach each other. Exactly. And when we teach each other, we learn more and it opens our minds a little bit more. So that can that will add to the softening of your heart a little bit more. So yeah, just being in a place where it's like, you know what, we may not agree, but I'm going to respect what you're saying. And then we're going to have a further conversation. We'll, we'll go in a more in-depth 
um, conversation when it comes to that. So definitely. Yeah, it's taking some time, but I'm trying to get there, trying to soften my heart and just kind of hear, say what I have to say. And like you said, be confident in what I, my beliefs and what I believe in, but still not be quick to anger and be quick to shut down and not listen to what they have to say to me. Because like you said, if I'm not willing to listen to them, they're not going to listen to me. And then we're both going to continue to have a views that do not align and they're not hearing what I have to say. And we can't learn from each other. So I agree with what you said. Yeah, that bridge cannot be built in a day. Exactly. <laughs> the next question that we have is, do you think the president again will stop racism from being as huge as it was when he was president? Absolutely not. I think race, racism has, this country has been built on racism. Um, for when you go back and look at any history books, you see that racism has existed from the existence of the Americas. So I don't think it's going to go away. Um, I don't, I, I still think there's an issue with it. Um, will some things then go undercover? Probably. Yeah. But I don't I don't think it's going to go away. But our our purpose is to figure out how we begin to make the shift that is not so painful. We in my lifetime, I won't see that racism will be abolished. In your lifetime, you may see some some um, significant changes. But at some point, it is my hope and my prayer that we will get to a point that we're able to move to a place where racism is not as prevalent or painful. But I don't think, no, I don't think it'll go away. I, I, I agree with what you said, because as a woman, as, as a black woman, as a Haitian woman, I've just experienced different things that I've experienced. And though I've experienced things before Trump was in presidency, it's just like people were more outwardly with this. So I feel like the tendencies and how people feel will continue to still be in their heart unless when they start learning and they're not as ignorant things and they're more knowledgeable of different people I feel like then things will change but I I agree with what you have to say and um and knowing that he wasn't like it was it's, it's still going to be there we just have to figure out a way to just kind of change things yeah we have to understand too um by some of the things that he presented in his speeches some of the things that he presented in his mannerisms the people that were watching him it was their interpretation and their interpretations in their minds allowed them to be more outward with their feelings that they had pretty much probably suppressed for a long time. So the perception that they could now move in and, and be comfortable with expressing those, it was an opportunity for them to do that based on what um, the um, conversations had been or speeches had alluded to. So we, do, we have to really be mindful of the words we use because words can hurt people, words can kill people, but words can also build people up. Yes. So we have to be really careful when we're talking to people. I agree, that was beautifully said. Okay, we have a few more questions to go. The next one is, if you could change diversity acceptance and stop racism at all colleges in the nation, how would you take that approach? Like, would you do flyers, workshops? What do you think is a, unofficially of course, I know you're starting something, but unofficially, like what do you think are some things that the college could do, or not just the college in general, but any colleges in the nation to kind of change diversity and have more people be acceptance and um, equal with everyone. Yeah, I think that really depends on the situation and the circumstances at any institution or any part of our communities and cultures. But I think the most important thing before we even get to the flyers is dialogue. Mm -hmm. We okay. need to have those conversations, uncomfortable conversations okay. we're going to have to have because we need to be able to verbalize what it is that we're feeling, thinking, seeing, doing. Um, and that only happens when you have those conversations. And when you have those face-to-face -face conversations in, in ways that are non-threatening, I think that's when you begin to see some movement. And then we can start talking about what we put to paper, how we invite other people in, but still not moving away from having dialogue intermittently as we're putting out paper, putting out documents, because face-to-face -face communication, I think, is most important. And that's, I, I tell my son all the time, it's like, stop texting, talk to people, you know? But we know that texting is a way of communicating, but when you're in front of a person, you get to see the body language. You get to see the movement. You know when the body becomes tense because they may be uncomfortable. Through a text message, Tend, most times it tends to be misinterpreted. Yes, ma'am. I, I, when you can have that face-to-face -face conversation and the way we're dialoguing right now, that helps create that 
in light of the fact that we're in the middle of a pandemic. So it still allows you to have face to face, but it's just done through technology. But I think the dialogue is going to be especially important. And then you need to really look at where you are. So one thing is recognize that there is an issue. Once you recognize it, then you can address it. If you don't recognize, if you say, oh, there's nothing wrong, there's nothing, that we're good, we're good to go, you're just going to always say, okay, they're saying it doesn't exist. So guess what? You'll never address it because you won't recognize that there is an issue. I agree. I think what you said about the uncomfortable conversation is really true. Sometimes it's hard to have those uncomfortable conversations, but they're important and they're crucial to make some stuff shake to make people start like understanding and um kind of get dialogue and conversation started and so i agree with having uncomfortable conversations and doing them respectively of course like you said but having those conversations nonetheless absolutely moving on we have another one okay when do we start to heal this country from all that has happened and is still happening you have to start now amen i like that you have to start now because we far too long have put it off We've delayed a lot of things. And sometimes I think we talk a lot, but then there's no action. So in order to get to a point where you begin to heal the country, you have to put some action to your words. We can listen to speeches. We can listen to most the most eloquent speakers. We can um, listen to those people who speak directly from the heart. But until you put actions to your words, we're not going to heal. So we definitely have to start now. I agree. I agree. Action is important. And I feel like that's something that I kind of lack. Like, I, I'll say a lot of things and um, I'll, sh I'll show my opinion of how I feel about things. But it's the next step. Calling people, saying how you feel about this, actually going the extra mile with not just saying, oh, I don't like this. I don't agree with this. But actually speaking to the people that can actually make that change and getting a little uncomfortable. That's what's needed to make some stuff shake and to actually get things done that need to be done. So I think that's that's a that I like how you were. That. That's correct. And, and with that, too, people have to be uncomfortable with being uncomfortable comfortable. Yeah. Because it's so easy to say, you know what, oh, that feels a little different for me. No, I'm not going to pursue it. But if you want to see things done, if you want to see change, if you want to see our country heal, we have to be uncomfortable with being uncomfortable and still make that step. Yes, ma'am, I agree. Okay. What are some ways that we can help um, in our own community in regards to equality and um, diversity? I think you find those organizations who are looking to make changes within your communities. Um, sometimes it's really difficult because you're not quite sure where to start. But of course, we have technology. So you have the Internet, you have Google. Um, I have a friend who tells me all the time, Google it, you know. So, you sure. know, we Google it. We find those organizations, those grassroots organizations, and it may not be something that's huge. But say, for instance, where you see a lot of inequities when it comes to children and now with children being on computer to learn, they may be having some difficulties keeping up with the curriculum. But there's a really small, small, small grassroots um, organization who tutors virtually. Step in and do something. You're beginning to make a difference. And it may not be big in the beginning. You may find organizations who donate computers to um, students. Be available to deliver the computer. You may not have the income to donate the computer, but you can definitely take the computer to the home site. Being careful in light of COVID, but there are ways I think that we can um, begin to help in our community. I agree. The small things eventually tumble up will lead to the bigger things, so I agree. Um, next question, we have two more. And okay. um, the next one is, how can we address the bad police officers and law enforcement? That is going to be having conversations with those um, with those entities. You've got to start addressing concerns with the lieutenants and the sergeants and really addressing it professionally and in an organized manner. You don't want to go in and you don't want to have this bullying attitude because that's going to cause people to stand off. But you also have to be comfortable again in who you are and what your mission is. So it has to be addressed from where it exists and you have to understand, but you also need to know some of the, the policies and procedures that they use when they're out policing the community. You want to understand why is it that there are more 
African American men and um, Latina and Hispanic men being arrested versus white men. What are your reasons for making sure a number of those arrested, but then these people, the same crime, the same um, incident, but they're never put in handcuffs? You want to understand that from where they sit and you want to understand more. And it's like, okay, I'm watching the, the body cam video. It seems like this person who was a Hispanic male, or Latina male was calm, but this person over here is in your face and saying all kinds of things, but you put this man in handcuffs and this one not. You have to address it from where it is and you need to have those conversations within those law enforcement agencies. If, if it's with the local, with the city police, if it's with the sheriffs, with the, which is a county, if it's with um, Florida Highway Patrol, which is Florida, you need to address it within those areas. And they really need to have and, and, and the ability to say, we want to have those open conversations and be willing to have those conversations. But we start with them where they are. And I agree, like how I, was, how I spoke about the next step, like saying that I, um, I don't like this or I don't, I, but the, to address it and to actually take the initiative to speak to somebody who can actually probably make a change, that's important. So I agree. Absolutely. Um, the last question that we have before you can make any like if you would like to make any like final um, remarks is how do you how do black and brown communities and people of color get the same rights as white communities? That's a tough one. That's a tough one because you have to again it goes back to educating yourself and looking at it. You have to look at the research. You have to look at the data. You got to pull all of that information. That's going to take some time and sometimes we're not patient and we want to rush some things. But with those communities, you need to understand if when you look at your, and I'm going to talk about local government here, you look at your county commissioners, your city commissioners, and you look at how things are so diverse. And I'm, I'm going to, um, I can't remember the, the specific term, but it's like um, the red line, the red line districts. Within this area, you know that things are going to happen because a certain um, group of population lives within that. And for us, and I and because it, I'm going to date myself, it was like anything that's across the railroad tracks, you know that you're not going to get the same treatment when it comes to property value. You're not going to get the same treatment when it comes to being charged um, through, through your municipalities. You notice that your water bills are going to be higher than this group over here. Incomes are going to be different. So we have to look at all of that. So educating ourselves on what we're looking at and then talk to your city commissioners, talk to your county governances, talk to those people and say, why is it different three blocks over mm -hmm. than what it is now in yeah. the area in which I live? So knowing and educating yourself on those kinds of things that you can present their policies back to them and say, where is it fair? Exactly. Then I think you'll begin to get some movement. All right, perfect. Now, do you have any more questions? Um, any more comments that you want to make before we wrap everything up? Really, um, Kat, I just want to encourage you and encourage any other student who has the momentum to move forward to begin to ask for change where you see things are not working. Um, I want you guys to consider how you can feel or let me ask you this question before I go there. Do you feel as a student that with in, with your experiences over the last six months and I want everybody else to really think about this and they can um, respond to your chat or whatever um, at a later date. Do you feel like that you are being treated as if you belong at SCF? I'm going to answer that now. Truth you can or if you want to wait, it's up to I you. Will wait. Yeah, we, me and you, we can have a conversation about it. OK, perfect, perfect. But you know, just for everybody else, just consider that because it's going to be real important in my transition to this position to help people know that in an inclusive environment, and that doesn't matter who you are, what color you are, what your background is, you need to feel like this institution wants you here. And you need to feel like you belong and that you have a voice. So I talk to students all the time. It's like, tell me what you think, because I'm interested. And once I become interested, then I can always go and sit down with my superiors and say, hey, look, students are thinking this way. How can we address this? What can we do to make things look a little bit better and feel better for them? Because if you don't feel comfortable in a place, you tend not to stay. Yes, ma'am. 
So we definitely want to make sure that students are feeling like they belong, that they have a voice, and that you know what we offer them is something that's going to be able to move them forward. Yes, we're part of the, the college, the Florida College system. We're going to offer courses, we're going to offer degrees, but the experiences that you have while you're there determines if it were meaningful to you and productive for you. So we definitely want to be able to provide that. And we want to do that for anybody who's connected with the college because we basically serve a community, a bi-county community, Sarasota and Manatee counties. And we want them to feel like, you know what, if the student is not ready to go off to the um, universities, the state college is the choice where they want to go. Yes, ma'am. And I feel like I really appreciate that you're taking the initiative to get students feedback because like it's for us and I really appreciate you taking the time to really get our feedback and kind of hear from us because I feel like sometimes when people want to help us. They don't ask us exactly what we want. They just kind of exactly. think you know, what we want. So I really appreciate you taking the time to kind of ask us what how we feel about things and listening and listening to what we have to say and taking initiative to get things done. And I really appreciate that. Oh, you're welcome. But you know, it's it's our responsibility because if we don't have our students, we don't have a college. So we need we need to hear the voice of the students. And for many times, and not necessarily at State College of Florida, but many times we, as people who are employed, tend to always want to tell the student, this is what you want, but we've never asked you. What do you want? So now it's time to ask. Perfect. All right. Thank you so much for your time, Dr. Pinkney. I really appreciate it. I learned a lot about speaking my truth, about being kind, to learn and be knowledgeable. Um, I hope anybody that was listening, they took something away from this. This was a great conversation. I really appreciate you being here and answering all of our questions. They, they may have been a little uncomfortable. Thank it's you for okay. and being truthful. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you for having me.